I want to welcome you all to uh, a discussion of psychedelics and recovery from addiction. I can honestly tell you that the thought of me using those two words, those phrases, or those two words, recovery <laughs> and psychedelics, those two words together really speaks to the times that we live in that we have come to this place and that it is now a moment uh, where we can explore. And, and so here are, are my guidelines for myself tonight. I'm interested in exploration. I'm interested in open-mindedness. I'm interested in open-heartedness. I'm interested in a really curious look at what's here because the topic at hand is exciting and thrilling for some and equally frightening and concerning to others. Let's just agree right now, energetically speaking, that we're coming together simply to express and explore our own collective experiences and so that I could make a commentary based on my own experiences. On the one hand, you have the proselytizers. Someone in this room, maybe many, have an agenda. These are the proselytizers. I heard from many of them in the last 48 hours since we announced this. They wrote me. They said things like, this is my experience and this is the way it is. And I hope that this comes up in your talk. Other people wrote, this is my experience. This is how this is. And don't forget to mention this. <laughs> so I know that some of the folks in the room are coming with an agenda and have a very strong opinion and are on the side of proselytizing for the use of psychedelics for a variety of, of, of reasons and cases. They've had an experience, which I honor. The proselytizers, you understand, are, 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 are among us. And I've been one of these at times, you know, on all sides of, of different arguments, different debates. Um, often we feel we can overstretch a little bit and feel that whatever the thing is, you know, it, it's going to be the thing for everybody or it is a thing for everybody. And we really need to, to you know, move forward and make sure that everybody knows this. These are the proselytizers. Some of, some of you may, may resonate with that. On the other side of this coin, we have the deniers. Those who refuse to see any value in psychedelics or any external plant medicine or drug or alcohol, they will sense a need to demonize or vilify these substances. Because on some level, these medicines, these guides, even though people have had positive experiences with them, some have, uh, they find them threatening. This category of people are driven somewhat by fear and this is the fear of change. They feel uh, perhaps a sense of threat uh, given the resurgence of interest in psychedelics. Then there may be people in the room who have no opinion. They are not in a debate of whether this works or not. They may be suffering. They may be in some form of stuckness, some form of mental health issue. They have no preconceived notion about psychedelics. They, they've never been in this debate before. They've never been in this discussion or, or sort of the, the exploration that we're in right now of, of psychedelics and recovery from addiction or recovery from a mental health issue. Their lives simply have not intersected with psychedelics before. Um, they frankly just wanna feel better. And maybe they came upon a therapist who suggested psychedelic therapy, or they heard about a friend who did it. Um, or maybe they saw Michael Pollan's series. You know, uh, these folks have really one question. Will psychedelic therapy help me? Is it right for me? Are there 
fears I should be aware of, concerns? Are there counterindications? Will these substances prove helpful? And if so, uh, how should I take them? Where should I take them? In what context should I take them? With whom should I take them? Over what period of time should I take them? What do I need to think about here? So you see, lots of people in this room, everyone with an opinion, really. And what I think is, I believe that many of you are here tonight to hear me express my position on this. Some of you are members of Recovery 2.0 or you've intersected with Recovery 2.0 and you recognize me as a person in long-term recovery from addiction of many kinds. You recognize me hopefully as a yogi and as a teacher of meditation and yoga and recovery. And I'm betting that for some, at least many of the people I heard from in the last 48 hours, some are looking to hear my position on this. Some are looking for guidance and some are looking to argue. And I want to tell you right now, I'm not going to give you my position on this. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> what I am going to do is I'm going to share my experience, my strength, and my hope with you. With regards to both of these topics, recovery and psychedelics. Before I dive in, I just want to say, I've been very nervous, anxious to speak publicly on these topics because my concern is that somebody will hear something, take it out of context, and end up doing something that is out of alignment with their truth. But I do want to share with you that it's been a little nerve wracking as I've thought about how to present this in a way that's neither advocating for or against anything. But hopefully what I say tonight will be liberating for you, clarifying for you, uh, helpful in some way, thought provoking, certainly. These are my hopes. I guess we should start with a resume. First on the psychedelic side. I'll do it like this. I came to psychedelics when I was 15 years old and I stopped taking psychedelics when I was 24. In that nine year period of time, I took what I consider to be an extraordinary amount of LSD, psilocybin mushrooms, MDMA, In the psychedelic realm, really, for me, it was mainly those three things. Now, here's the interesting thing. I'll make a statement. In my nine years of experimenting with psychedelics, I experienced some of the most important and profound experiences of my life. If I make that statement to you, and you take that statement and you run home with that statement. Your process of considering my experience will be incomplete. The statement is true, but it's incomplete. Let's expand the statement. In my nine years of experimenting with psychedelics, I experienced some of the most helpful and profound experiences of my life. While that was going on, I descended into full-blown heroin and cocaine addiction and alcoholism. Ah, now you have a different understanding of my experience. At first, you might think, oh, Tommy's advocating for the use of psychedelics on the one hand. Now you might think, ooh, Tommy's advocating against the use of psychedelics. No, I'm doing neither. Let's expand the statement even more. In my nine years of exploring, uh, of experimenting with psychedelics, I experienced some of the most profound and helpful moments of my life. 
I was experiencing full-blown drug addiction toward the end of that. Later on, I would get clean, abstinent from all drugs and alcohol, sober, right? And I would find recovery. I would also find the very powerful and deep well of yoga and meditation. And I would take the, the path of recovery and yoga and meditation into my life as the focus of my life without drugs and alcohol of any kind, without plant medicines and without psychedelics of any kind for the next 31 years until this moment. In a way, you have my resume. Does this mean that I have an opinion for you about what you ought to be thinking or ought to be doing when you consider all the many infinite choices that you have every day? I have no opinion for you. I have no position to present. All the statements I just made are true. These are my experience. Do I regret taking psychedelics? No. Do I regret doing heroin and cocaine? On some level, I would say, I would say I didn't get anything from heroin and cocaine except to my bottom. So they gave me a bottom from which I could recover and really hit, the, hit what I consider to be the jackpot in life. What is the jackpot in life? It's the reason you came here tonight. Certainly not to listen to me. You're looking for the same thing I'm looking for. And you're wondering, has something been missing? And maybe this resurgence in psychedelics and psychedelic therapy could be the thing I've been missing. So let's unpack it a little bit. The thing that you're looking for, that I'm looking for, see, I'll put a word on that that could be offensive or misunderstood. The thing you're looking for is God. Goddess. Spirit. The all in all. Oneness. Wholeness. Love. That's what you're looking for. That's what I'm looking for. It's not a guess. We're all on the same page when it comes to this. <clears throat> you might not choose the word God. I just use that, that word to express the totality of all. Would I be who I am today without having taken psychedelics? Uh, of course not. I'd be someone different. I'd be something different. Who would I be today if I'd never practiced yoga? Someone different. Who would I be today if I never meditated? Something different, someone different. I came to these drugs in my mid-teens, these plant medicines, these guides, whatever your word's for. If I use the word drug, and I know there's some people be offended by that word because it has a negative connotation. I just mean mind-altering mind substance. Hmm? Michael Pollan came to these substances in his 60s the very different experience he's having than what I had. What's expressed in his show and in his book is an exploration of therapy, essentially thera therapeutic uses for psychedelics. And so the question is on the table. Are, psych are psychedelics relevant? Do they have a purpose? And I would say, of course they do. And of course, they're relevant. How do I know that? Because they're on the planet. Because they're here. Because people have used them and had positive effects in their life take place. Does that mean they're for everyone? No. But there's a relevance. We really get into a struggle when we start speaking about people in recovery from addiction who have a core problem that they are now facing which brings many of those people here tonight to explore this. I've had extremely positive experiences, very enjoyable, and I've had very difficult and hard and painful experiences as well. As I told you, I took, you know, so many psychedelic experiences and I, it didn't prevent me from having to face my demons. It didn't take my demons away. It didn't. 
I went all the way to the bottom of my life, despite having had these very powerful glimpses and experiences. And, and that's interesting. That's interesting to me. So for, the, for this group of people that are stuck in abject depression, uh, unbelievable anxiety that they can't get out of, uh, various mental health conditions like OCD and other things. For that group of people, in some cases, especially if they're called to it, they may need some help. Historically, we've gotten some kind of pharmaceutical help for these people. And I haven't seen a lot of those things on the pharmacological level put out by pharmaceutical companies, I haven't seen a lot of those things sort of work widespread. It's a lot of different data and a lot of, I've seen a lot of painful things and I've seen a lot of people in, in my line of work trying to get off of different kinds of medications that they've been put on by professionals. Could psychedelics possibly be an upgrade? Could they provide uh, a window, uh, a new avenue for people to get past depression and other mental health issues? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. I don't say that as opinion. It's because I'm looking at other people in the world who have had positive experiences when they were in really difficult mental health situations. So certainly these, these substances can't be blown off. You can't just say, no, this is not for anyone, this is bad, this is dangerous. It, it, would be it would be as ridiculous for me to say to somebody, psychedelics are for everyone in every situation. That would be as ridiculous as saying psychedelics are for nobody in any situation. So that then brings us to the issue of a particular form of mental health issue known as addiction. So here's where I, I share my personal experience. When I took psychedelics, I felt like I was watching a trailer to a movie. It was a trailer to a movie that I really wanted to see. But I didn't get to see the whole movie. I was given the trailer, and then essentially I was kicked out of the movie theater at the end of the night. And then it was my job to sort of try to integrate whatever bits and pieces I had seen, a glimpse of something else or something different. We're, we're, we're talking about the concept of changing one's mind, right? If you're stuck in addiction, you're stuck in depression, you're stuck in anxiety, you're stuck in whatever it is, it's the mind. The mind is the problem. So we're talking about how do we change our mind? Okay. I hadn't yet figured it out. Psychedelics were helping me to see something different and they were helping me, maybe prepping me for something down the road, perhaps. But as I said, it didn't help me to deal with my addictive issues. It didn't help me to get beyond my demons. It didn't help me work out my resentments. It didn't help me work out my anger. It didn't help me work out my sense of disconnection, my sense of aloneness in this world. But I still feel like they were helpful in some ways but it was like seeing a trailer. I've wanted to see the movie. Now I had a big, very powerful conversation with Ram Dass. And uh, he asked me, he said, do you think psychedelics led you into drug addiction? And I said, no, that's not how I see that at all. I said, separation, disconnection led me into drug, ad drug addiction, not psychedelics. Psychedelics showed me some important things. They were what I had available to me to change my mind. Um, I didn't have a mentor, a yoga teacher. I didn't have a spiritual teacher. I didn't have anyone to help me unravel the incredibly painful childhood that I had had. I didn't know how to come down from my hyperactivity. I had wired my brain through a, an atrocious diet as a child. And frankly, I was in a lot of pain. I was also just on the hyperactive side of, of life. I wasn't the depressive side. I was more on the never stop moving side of life. Anxiety was my thing. For other people, it's depression. For other people, it's suppression. 
for other people, it's rage. It comes out one way or another. But this was all I had at my disposal, I felt. So I went there and that's what I had. And it helped me in the moment, it helped me to sort of rearrange and manage navigating for a period of time. There were a couple of times in my life that psychedelic experiences were so profound for me, so intense and so uh, uh, blissful, joyful, that I ended up chasing those experiences. That's part of my addictive personality, that I would chase those experiences. And that's a very, very important thing for me to know about myself. I have a sneaking suspicion that if I were to engage in substances today, plant medicines, whatever it is, I have a feeling that it would kick into sort of motion a certain quality of thinking that I'm not really trying to wake up, if you will. I, I tend to chase really lovely and, and, and blissful experiences to, my, to, my, to a fault, to my detriment. I refer to that as addiction. So that's an important thing to understand that as my, in my childhood, this was what was available. I went after it. And when I went after it, I really went after it. Now it needs to be said in Michael Pollan's series on Netflix. I really appreciate it. First of all, I appreciate the series. I appreciate what it's trying to do. There's only one or two things that for me are really problematic in there. One of the statements that he makes is psychedelics are, are totally non-addictive substances. And while I understand what he's trying to say, that these are not physically addictive in the sense of the way an opiate is physically addictive, where you build up a tolerance. And then if, if you take the drug away, a person goes into withdrawal and, and painful withdrawal. I understand what he's saying. But for him to say that psychedelics are not addictive for me, and it's no disrespect meant to a, to a great writer and a man who's done a lot of thinking and, and, and work around this, uh, it shows and displays an, an unbelievable, astonishing ignorance about what addiction is. He's looking at a physical sort of manifestation of addiction. That's just one sl sliver of what's going on. Addiction is here. Addiction is in the mind. And I've seen plenty of kids, plenty of people in my day be addicted to psychedelic experiences, meaning they continue to take psychedelics, even though it's not serving them any longer. And it's actually causing some of the very mental health issues that they are trying to get out of. Also, in, in some of these extreme use cases, people are... are completely ungrounding themselves, untethering themselves. So I do want to say, uh, yeah, these are not physically addictive in the, in, the, in, the, in the sense of an opiate. But you, of course, you can get addicted to the experience and want to chase after that. So it's something to be mindful of. So Ram Dass said to me, after I told him, I said, I don't feel psychedelics led me into addiction. I mean, addiction was there long, long before I ever took psychedelics. Psychedelics didn't solve that problem for me. I had work to do. So Ramda said to me, his teacher told him, you know, Neem Karoli Baba, one of the great yogi saints was Ramdas's teacher, a, a man that displayed such unconditional love of him and his students and just an extraordinary, extraordinary man and being. And he, Ramdas had explained that, you know, his teacher had said about LSD that, you know, LSD would deliver you into a room with Jesus Christ. But you'd have to leave the room. And Ramdas said, now I'm working on the real thing. And I'm in the room all the time. And he goes, yeah. <laughs> That's what he did. <laughs> yeah. Just like that. 
What is the real thing? Well, for him, it was, he recognized the, the ego is who you think you are. The spiritual heart, the center is who you are. I am loving awareness. I am loving awareness. And being an embodiment of that in the world, in everything that you do, what's the problem? The problem is the mind. The mind is the culprit. He was saying through yoga, meditation, through communing with self, cultivating the ability to sit still, cultivating the ability to be in silence and to listen, one could attain the, the thing we all came here for, which is this realization, the self-actualization and self-realization, the realization of the divinity within each one of us, of our divine nature. We're here tonight just to discuss what's the role of psychedelics in fulfillment? What's the role of psychedelics in our recovery of this soul connection? That's what we're discussing. So when Ram Das said, you know, yeah, you can get into the room with Jesus, but you're going to get kicked out of that room. And, and the real thing awaits us all when we are able to really cultivate this silence, this meditative mind, and to be in the room all the time. So for me, I went through the portal of psychedelics. I went through the portal and the pain of, of severe addiction. And then I got sober and I entered another portal. Let me describe this other portal. It was a portal that millions of people have walked through. It was a portal that delivers you into a deep spiritual connection. It's a portal that builds a relationship between you and this divinity that we're talking about. It's a portal that would, quote, rocket you into the fourth dimension. That you would have interest in your fellows, you would lose interest in yourself, that you would be free from things that used to plague you, that you would feel like you had a sense of purpose and meaning in this world, and you could engage in the world in a new way. What's the portal? The 12 steps. The 12 steps. I went through that portal next. And that portal, for me, just for me, Delivered on its promise. Now, in Michael Pollan's series, at the very beginning, in the first episode, sort of 10 or 20 minutes in, he says, and isn't it interesting that the founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, the, the man who wrote, co-wrote the 12 steps, had his spiritual awakening after being administered a psychedelic. After being administered a psychedelic. Now, a friend of mine wrote me a text the other day before I had seen Michael Pollan's series. And my friend wrote, I had no idea that Bill W. had taken LSD before writing the 12, uh, uh, before he got sober. I had no idea that Bill W. had taken LSD before he got sober. And I did a quick calculation in my, in my head Bill, Bill W. got sober in 1935. LSD didn't come around until 1943 when Albert Hoffman synthesized it in Switzerland. So how could it be possible that Bill W. took LSD and I was up in arms and I'm like, oh God, I'm going to have to talk to Michael Pollan. That, I got to talk to that guy, <laughs> you know? And of course, he didn't say that. He said... Bill Wilson had had the spiritual awakening that led to his sobriety when being administered a psychedelic, not LSD, but a psychedelic. And as you go into the history of Alcoholics Anonymous, you'll see a couple of interesting things. In point of fact, Bill Wilson, the founder of Alco co founder of Alcoholics Anonymous, was in the hospital being given um, a treatment called the Belladonna treatment. And there was a psychoactive substance that he was being given 
during that time when he had a white light experience. And the result of the white light experience, he had a major download. When that white light experience ended, this was the download that came to him. I'm an alcoholic. I have to share my experience with another alcoholic. If I just share my experience, my strength, my hope with another alcoholic, I can't explain why, but I'm going to be able to be sober. And maybe the other person will be too. And that was the founding concept which changed the lives of untold millions of people from that moment until now. Of people who had no hope, who had no idea, no way forward to get out of severe alcoholism, drug addiction, all of it. People have been trying, working on this for a long, long time. We're still working on it now. And, and even here tonight, we're wondering, wow, could psychedelics have a part in all this? Well, apparently some psychedelic had a part in that unfolding. And I find it fascinating, interesting, and cool. You can make of that whatever you will. Bill Wilson and, and Dr. Bob went on to write The 12 Steps and put out the book, Alcoholics Anonymous, and the rest is history. Very, very powerful unfolding of ideas. So when Michael Pollan puts this in his series, I'm not sure what his purpose is, but I think what it came off to me like he's trying to draw a conclusion that isn't it interesting how psychedelics are playing an important role in the in advancement of humanity? So here was an advancing concept, seemingly brought about by a psychedelic. And then later on, he speaks about Steve Jobs taking acid and how powerful the, you know, the creation of, of Apple's products and, and, you know, all of the, the internet and the web and all, all the stuff that we now are sort of dealing with, you know, I would argue what the sum total benefit of it all is, but I would say it's certainly we're moving forward in some direction. But so the connection there is, and I, I have never spoken to Michael Pollan, I don't know him. And again, I, I appreciate his work and his thought. My question for him would be, you know, are you trying to draw a conclusion that psychedelics are necessary, meaning um, elemental? Are psychedelics elemental to human development at this point? Are you trying to say that in the most important moments in life, you'll find psychedelics there? In our society, as we move forward, you'll find psychedelics there. Because of course, if that's your position, you'll find whatever you want to find. You'll find the, the, the data. And if your position is that psychedelics have, have no value for humanity whatsoever, you'll find that data too. But it's interesting. You know, for me, as an individual, I see the interconnectedness of all things. I can't, I can't blow this off any more than I can blow off the 12 steps as the, as the unbelievable portal that I went through that rocketed me into the fourth dimension and still does every day. And then I found yoga, yet another portal, and meditation, yet another portal that delivers me into the fourth dimension and anywhere I desire to travel in the universe, it's inside me. And so I like to go there and I'm into exploring the mystical. I'm trying to do it internally. I work on that every day. It's important for me to have this commitment to abstinence, but it's not important for anybody else unless they determine it is for themselves because above all, I'm begging for all of us to, to give each other uh, freedom. You know, right now, right this minute, there are groups of people in Alcoholics Anonymous who say they are sober, but they smoke cannabis every day or, or often or whenever they feel like it. Now, to people in Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous, that's kind of a no-no. <laughs> that doesn't make sense. But in Alcoholics Anonymous, the stated um, requirement for membership is simply a desire to not drink. So if these people are not drinking, but they want to smoke pot, shouldn't they be allowed to do that? But here's the problem. This brings up a lot of concern, a lot of confusion for 12-step recovery folks like me. What does the word sober 
mean? Not the, the definition in the dictionary is not drunk. Sober, not drunk. So by pure definition in English, if you're smoking cannabis, you're sober as long as you're not drinking. But within our society of 12-step universe, that's not the case. That's not what we mean when we talk about sober. And when we talk about recovery, we're really talking about abstinence from drugs and alcohol. So much confusion, so many questions. And I'm betting that there are many people here on this topic of psychedelics that are wondering, you know, I'm stuck. I'm in 12-step recovery, but I'm unhappy. This, this experience you've had, Tommy, of being rocketed into the fourth dimension, I haven't had that experience. And you might walk away from this talk tonight and you might think, shit, if I had taken LSD and taken all these psychedelics like Tommy did when he was a kid, maybe I would now have this experience. So, you know, maybe I need to have that experience now. All I could say is we better take a look at some things that one should think about if you're on a path of recovery from addiction, from any addiction, if you have a personality like mine, if you have a mind like mine. See, in Recovery 2.0, if you're going to come on retreat with us, you have to be abstinent from all drugs and alcohol for at least 30 days before the retreat. That includes psychedelics of any kind. It's not that I disagree with your choice. It's just not what we work on and what we do on our retreats and in our world of Recovery 2.0. We're working on the mind and the body from a abstinent and spiritual, mental, and physical standpoint. We're applying philosophy, spirituality, psychology. We're applying our own direct experience, yoga, meditation, healthy diet, diet changes, lifestyle. Um, looking at our relationships to people, looking at our relationships to the body, our breath, and food. This is the work that we do. If you want to go on retreat with groups of people who are doing yoga, meditation, who are taking psychedelics, believe me, you'll have no trouble finding those retreats. <laughs> and I think that's wonderful. You should be able to go where you want to go. But let's discuss for a moment some things that you might consider. If you're a person like me in recovery from addiction, because it brings up a lot of challenges for us. One of the, I, I've, I've sort of identified two main fears that, that you, I, we might have if you're considering moving down in this direction. One of those fears is to lose your recovery. Meaning what happens if I have this experience and I either want more of it and more of it, and it sort of triggers an addictive mindset, or I go back to other substances. Like, you know, I, for example, I know a few people who are drug addicts and alcoholics who went and did some plant medicine ceremonies and other ceremonies, and, and some of them went back to drinking, got into trouble over there for a little while, but they managed to come back into 12 step recovery and integrate the experiences that they had and move forward. Okay. I know other people that didn't come back and who are really, really struggling around addiction. So that is a concern. I'm not saying that'll happen to everybody. You know, what I, what I can say is I have zero experience with taking psychedelic drugs in recovery. I've not done ayahuasca. I can't speak to you about the experience of it. I've watched thousands of people around me. I've watched their experiences, but I don't have direct experience. I can't share with you from that place. I've not done any psychedelic of any kind, no drugs or alcohol, um, except caffeine, <laughs> that, that crowd favorite. Other than that, I've done no drugs and alcohol for 31 years. So you need to have that. But still, the, I understand the addictive mind. And so one concern will be, I'll give up my recovery. I'll give up my, my clarity and my, my stance as a person dedicated to abstinence and the importance of that, which is very important for me. It's important for me because I love it. I love to explore life as a person who's not taking uh, external drugs and alcohol. I love it. I love it so much. 
And it's been so good to me that I, I don't really feel the need to change that. I don't have a pulling to it, but I know a lot of you do. And sometimes we're in a really rough spot. Would I sit here and tell you not to use psychedelics? If you personally are called to them, you feel like that's a necessary thing in your life, you're a grown person. I can't comment for you. You will have to make up your mind with hopefully these considerations. So the first fear is you'll give up your recovery. You'll, you'll kick the mind into motion, the addictive mind into motion, and that might be problematic. The second fear is what will people think of me in my sober community? Will I be accepted? Will I be welcome in a meeting? If I want to go to an AA meeting, will they welcome me? NA meeting, any meeting. Who can I talk to? What if, what if I'm microdosing and I don't want anybody to know? Well, that can't be a healthy way to go through the world. So this hits on that issue of, you know, concern about what other people think, um, concern about losing a support system that is very powerful. Um, these are very real and very powerful concerns. So here's my, my thought about it is this. If somebody came to me and said, I'm sober five years and I'm thinking about taking uh, X, Y, and Z psychedelic, I, I feel like I need to have this experience. You know, can I count on you to support me? The answer is, hell yes. I will help you in any way I can to make the most out of that experience and for you to integrate the best you can and then to do the most important thing. And this is going to be the most important thing I say tonight to do the work that you still must do in order to realize yourself for the rest of your life, one day at a time. So this is the great concern I have for people who struggle with addiction is once again, we're looking for a magic bullet. And the magic bullet thing is really tricky. If you are looking for the psychedelic experience to solve your life's problems, as you heard from me, that is just unrealistic. And any decent therapist who's working with psychedelics will tell you that up front. The most important thing is what happens after. How will you integrate whatever it is you're shown or what you learn? How will you one day at a time do the work of the same work that the 12 steps allow anybody to do, whether you're ever going to get into those steps or not? You have to deal with your anger. You have to let go of your resentments. Not because I say so, because a life filled with resentment is futile. And we know that people who struggle with addiction have a lot of those things called resentments. How will you move forward? How will you move into a place where you can be engaged in the world in a purposeful and meaningful way? How will you be of service if you're weighed down by all of these emotions in the past? Half the reason, I mean, at least, that I don't feel like I need psychedelics today anymore, I'm not pulled to it, is because of the richness of the 12-step experience that I had and in particular, also in, in, uh, in conjunction with yoga. Those two things together have been so profound for me. So profound. They have allowed me a vehicle to do the work of my life. Yeah, the psychedelics, they helped me navigate my childhood. I needed that at the time. Didn't solve all my problems, but it was helpful for me. I mean that. So again, not black, not white. Can, can psychedelics be helpful to someone who's in severe alcoholism? Maybe. How could I say yes or no? Maybe. Someone in severe depression? Maybe. I've seen people benefit tremendously. And so when people are really in trouble, I just want their pain to stop. And if this is a way that can help, I'm all for it. 
It's just not what I do. But I will support anyone on their mission, on their path. And if I'm the last person left in the world that's, <laughs> that's decided not to engage in psychedelic therapy, so be it. I found everything that I ever could have dreamt of and then some in the path of the 12 steps in yoga and meditation. Two last things I want to say. If you're on the abstinent journey, then we're going to have to get used to the idea that there are going to be people in 12-step programs who are taking psychedelics. And I'll tell you what, we better love those people. And I mean love them. And in order to love them, we're going to have to get past our threat. People wrote me, this is a threat to our way of life. No, it's not. No, it's not. Make a decision. Be on your path. More will be revealed. Be in love. Be in love. We had better find a way to allow people to try to figure out their shit and be loving while we're doing it. I only have the answers for me, and I'm not even sure I have those answers. <laughs> I'm just one day at a time muddling through this human existence. This is not a moral issue. Good, bad, right, wrong. Like we really have to get out of that. But if you feel threatened, if you feel threatened by this resurgence of psychedelics, it's something for you to look at inside. If you stay sober, choose the path of recovery in an abstinent 12-step kind of way. There will be tough days in your life because that's part of the human condition no matter what path you choose. But if you have a tough time for a string of weeks, it's very easy to, to, to say, oh, I want to take something to fix this, change this. At this point, I'm enjoying leaning into my suffering. I'm enjoying leaning into what I can learn from my pain. No, I'm not depressed. No, I'm not having suicidal ideation. If I were, that would be a very different situation. I would have to report on that. And if I were thinking about ending my life, you better believe I'd be open to a lot of different possibilities. Final thing. Diet is more important than anybody seems to be expressing in our recovery and in mental health issues. Diet is more important. Diet is going to affect your blood chemistry, your hormonal balance, the way your brain works. It's very, very important piece of the puzzle. And I wish before people go on medication or go on long periods of, of, uh, of psychedelic protocols or, or in, a, in conjunction with, I would just really like people to get to the point of detoxification of the digestive tract, detoxification of the mind and the body, that these protocols are so important and breath work, critically important and yoga, movement, athletics, critically important. Let's not forget these very, very important modalities that so many people are not engaging in and they're depressed and then they, they go to the external rather than doing the thing, moving the body, calming the mind, learning how to train and become a meditator. Um, learning how to move the body in yoga, learning how to change your diet and your lifestyle. Let's not forget how important and, and, and effective these things are.